Philippine Natural Tuberculosis Prevent Prevalence Survey, multiple chapters in U.S. textbooks and landscape. Please all welcome Dr. Joseph Adrian John D. Buenzalino. Buenzalino. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to all. Okay, so our first topic will be, uh, first lecture will be given by Dr. Arona Bergantin. Um, sorry, the lecture, Dr. Arona. Okay, I'm trying doing the slide share. Okay, so can you see the can you see the slides now? Yes, doctor. Okay. So good morning to our colleagues who took time from their busy schedules to attend this webinar. Thunderstorms have been occurring all over the country once in a while, and we get to experience showers in between the hot and humid weather though we are still awaiting for the southwest monsoon and the official announcement from Pagasa that the rainy season in our country has indeed arrived. With such announcement, we are expecting a possible rise in the reported cases of dengue, which will be the topic of this morning's discussion. So this is our main objective for today. We also aim to tackle the following points this morning. I have tried my best to unearth the current Philippine statistics regarding dengue, but the last report I have seen at the DOH webpage was dated August 2019. Luckily, veering away from the website, I have found two accounts regarding dengue during this time of COVID pandemic. We have here the report from the WIPRO last May 21, stating that the Philippines has a total of 48,194 dengue cases from January to May 2, 2020, which was around 40% lower than the reported cases during the same period of 2019. Almost a week later, the Provincial Health Officer of Pangasinan had similar observation that there are lower numbers of cases of dengue compared to the data last year, though she has mentioned that there are higher mortalities which she has somewhat attributed to the limited mobility of individuals and limited transportation, wherein we may posit that consultation may have been done a bit late when patients are already severely ill and are moribund. These are familiar information to all of us. Dengue is brought about by any of the four closely related but serologically distinct type of dengue virus. The virus is transmitted to humans during blood meals of female Aedes mosquitoes, which can be widely found in the subtropics and tropics. The incubation period typically ranges from 3 to 14 days, and symptoms often manifest within 4 to 7 days following the mosquito bite. Infection with one serotype confers sterilizing immunity with that same serotype and renders partial and temporary protection to the other serotypes. In 2009, the WHO and the Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Diseases published dengue guidelines, which replaced the 1997 edition. In this update, dengue classification has been revised into dengue, dengue with warning signs, and severe dengue as people have been cognizant of the fact that not all patients with serious illness will be able to fulfill the old criteria for dengue hemorrhagic fever. In the latest update, the warning signs have been underscored to optimize management. So adopted from the WHO TDR guidelines, the DOH has published its compendium in 2011, and the classification are presented here. Probable dengue without warning signs may be considered in a febrile patient who has traveled or is living in an endemic area with any two of the following, headache, body malice, myalgia, arthralgia, retroorbital pain, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, flushed skin, and rash. The particular rashes, which when arranged as aisles of white in a sea of red, is what we call as Hermann's rash. In the laboratory, leukopenia with or without thrombocytopenia may be seen along with dengue antigen or antibody. For probable cases to be categorized as confirmed, the virus should be isolated or the dengue RNA detected. The presence of the following needs to be emphasized as these manifestations indicate more serious conditions, which we will see later will matter on the decision-making for admission. 
abdominal pain or tenderness, clinical signs of fluid accumulation, um, whether ascites or pleural effusion, persistent vomiting, mucosal bleeding, liver enlargement, coincidental hemoconcentration and thrombocytopenia, and lethargy or restlessness. These individuals will be categorized as having dengue with warning signs. In the presence of any of the warning signs plus the existence of severe plasma leakage with resultant shock or fluid accumulation with respiratory embarrassment, severe bleeding, severe organ impairment, the person is said to have severe dengue. We need to be reminded again that dengue is an illness which is characterized by three phases, which we will tackle one by one. The febrile phase is characterized by the presence of pyrexia and the nonspecific symptoms we may have enumerated later, uh, er earlier rather. During this time, the insensible water loss may be a bit higher due to the temp temperature elevations or the patient having poor oral intake. Thus, dehydration may be seen. During this time, the hemogram will generally show normal values of hematocrit and platelet. The virus is actively present in the blood, hence cultures may be done or dengue antigen detected. Following the febrile phase is the critical phase, which is characterized by the lysis of fever and improvement in the general well-being of the patient. There is also plasma leakage, hence the hemoconcentration, and in some instances, shock. Thrombocytopenia is accompanied by bleeding in some cases. During this time, the antigen is slowly decreasing in amount as the body is able to mount antibodies which neutralize the virus. IgM may be detected as early as four days in some individuals and IgA may be present a day later. IgG may be detectable in small amounts by the seventh day as we basically know that the class switching of antibodies from IgM need to occur first. Take note that the critical phase is not present in all patients, as some go directly from febrile to the next phase, which I will be discussing, the recovery phase. Patients continue to be afebrile, and the fluid that has accumulated in the third phases are now being reabsorbed. Thus, fluid overload may be a complication in this phase. Platelets and hematocrit return to normal levels, and in the blood, antibodies are detectable in larger amounts. To support the clinical diagnosis of dengue, ancillary procedures may be done and monitored regularly during the occurrence of the illness, such as the hemogram. Organ-specific tests may be requested depending on the clinical presentation of the patient. Viral cultures may be done using the mosquito cell lines. Nucleic acid detection may be done using various techniques. Widely available antigen detection kits utilize the dengue NS1 and in some countries possibly the non-structural protein too. The presence of the antibodies is not always confirmatory of dengue as some false positive cross-reactions with other flabby viruses may occur, including even some bacteria like leptospirosis. However, an evidence of seroconversion or a fourfold rise in the titers of antibodies impaired acute and convalescent sera confirm the existence of dengue infection. To effectively diagnose and manage a patient with dengue, a complete history and thorough physical examination ought to be done, supported by the routine and dengue-specific tests. Categorization of the patient via symptoms as well as the phase of the illness should be established for appropriate management, whether at home or inside the hospital, with or without the need for intensive care unit facilities. We are also duty-bound to report dengue to the DOH surveillance program. So patients who fall under treatment category A are managed from home, and these are patients who are able to tolerate adequate volumes of oral fluids, pass urine at least once every six hours, and do not have any of the warning signs, particularly when the fever subsides. Daily monitoring of the temperature pattern, volume of fluid intake, and losses, volume and frequency of the urine, presence of warning signs, plasma leakage and bleeding, hematocrit and white blood cell and platelet counts should be done. 
Those who have warning signs, coexisting conditions that may make dengue or its management more complicated, such as pregnancy, infancy, old age, obesity, diabetes mellitus, renal failure, chronic hemolytic diseases, and some certain circumstances like living alone, living far from a health facility without reliable means of transport, are managed in hospital under treatment category B. Hydration using isotonic fluid is the key, the rate of which is dependent on the vital signs, levels of hematocrit, urine output, and oral intake. As such, aside from the above mentioned parameters, blood glucose and other organ function markers should be monitored. Those with severe dengue should be managed inside the hospital facilities with provision for intensive care. It is important to maintain effective circulating volume, thus IVF resuscitation using isotonic fluid should be performed with caution to avoid overload. Replacement or maintenance fluid should be watched. In the case of hypotensive shock, aside from crystalloids, colloids may be used. The ideal body weight is used for calculating fluid infusion rates for those who are overweight or obese. And blood transfusion should only be given in cases with suspected or severe bleeding. The goals of resuscitation include improving central and peripheral circulation and the end organ perfusion. Dengue complications may arise and may include but are not limited to the following. Fluid overload, hyper or hypoglycemia, electrolyte and acid-base imbalances, co-infections, and nosocomial infections. The mortality rate in dengue without warning sign is less than 1%, while those with warning signs or severe dengue has a rate of 2 to 5%. Needless to say, Untreated dengue with warning sign or severe dengue carries a very high percentage of mortality. The group of Lahimi identified several factors which can portend mortality. Atypical presentations, presence of significant comorbid illness, abnormal seromarkers, and the existence of secondary bacterial infections, which are only often suspected when the patient isn't improving despite appropriate management of dengue with normalization of hemogram or markers. This is easier to consider in patients who remain pyrexic. Now, moving on, coronavirus disease is due to the infection with SARS-CoV-2. This human coronavirus shares almost 80% homology with SARS-CoV-1. Transmission is mainly via the droplet route, Though contact and even airborne transmissions may be possible, the latter more particularly when performing aerosol generating procedures. The, they cause zoonotic spillovers as their main hosts are other mammals and fowls which have, had, which have the anti angiotensin converting enzyme receptors in their airways and gastrointestinal tract. Majority present with fever and cough, and some manifest with fatigue, anorexia, shortness of breath, and myalgia. Still, some have symptoms such as sore throat, nasal congestion, headache, diarrhea, nausea and vomiting, anosmia, or agusia. The incubation period has a median of five days, and 98% of patients will become symptomatic within 11 days after acquiring the virus. Fever lasts until 12 days, while cough may last until 19 days. Median time from illness onset to dyspnea was 13 days. Sepsis becomes evident within nine days after illness onset, and ARDS occurs within a median of 12 days. Acute cardiac and kidney injuries both occur within a median of 15 days, and secondary infection can be observed within a median of 17 days. The incidence of ARDS is 14.8%. The severity of COVID is classified as follows, and we will tackle them one by one in the succeeding slides. Mild COVID are for those patients who, have symptomatic, who, who are symptomatic and meet the case definition for COVID-19 without evidence of viral pneumonia or hypoxia. For moderate disease, patients with clinical signs of pneumonia, which will include fever, cough, dyspnea, or tachypnea, 
but no signs of severe pneumonia, including O2 saturation of more than 90% on room air. Those who are classified under severe disease are patients with clinical signs of pneumonia, as stated previously, plus one of the following. Respiratory rate of more than 30 breaths per minute, severe respiratory distress, or oxygen saturation of less than 90% on room air. For those patients with critical disease under acute respiratory distress syndrome, this is considered in those who within one week of a known clinical insult has a new or worsening respiratory symptoms with bilateral opacities not fully explained by volume overload, low bar or lung collapse or nodules in chest in aging and evident respiratory failure with no underlying cardiac failure nor fluid overload. The severity of ARDS can be categorized based on the values of the ratio of the arterial oxygen partial pressure and the fraction of inspired oxygen. Mild between 200 to 300 millimeters mercury, moderate between 100 to 200 millimeters mercury, and severe less than 100 millimeters mercury. Critically ill septic patients have acute life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to suspected or proven infection. And the clinical indications of organ dysfunction include altered mental status, difficult or fast breathing, low oxygen saturation, reduced urine output, tachycardia, weak pulses, skin mottling, cold extremities, or hypotension while laboratory parameters include evidence of coagulopathy, thrombocytopenia, acidosis, elevated lactate, and hyperbilirubinemia. Those septic patients with persistent hypotension despite volume resuscitation and requires vasopressors to maintain mean arterial pressure above 65 millimeters mercury and serum lactate levels above 2 millimoles per liter are said to be in septic shock. Just to emphasize, SARS-CoV-2 antibody tests are not recommended for diagnosis of current infection with COVID-19. RT-PCR needs to be done to show the presence of SARS-CoV-2 RNA. And here is a table which shows the varying sensitivity of samples based on the site of collection. Highest yield will be seen in the bronchoalveolar specimen and by deduction from ET aspirate. And in decreasing order, self-collected sputum, um, nasal swabs, brush biopsy specimen, pharyngeal swabs, stool, and blood. Aside from the site of collection, the recovery of the SARS-CoV-2 RNA may be influenced by the time of collection in relation to the time of entry of the pathogen and the development of symptoms. In the pre-symptomatics, at least a week before the onset of symptoms, asopharyngeal swabs may already become positive and the chances of recovery increases as the symptoms manifest with decreasing, rate if recovery, with decreasing rates of recovery as the weeks pass by. Likewise, Early on, the virus can be cultured from respiratory tract specimen, but we have to understand that this may be quite difficult as coronaviruses are quite fastidious to grow even when, the, when using human airway epithelium cell lines. A few days further, and shortly before the symptoms develop, recovery from okay, the positive okay, well, well, well. and sputum PCR may now be possible. Take note that stool PCR recovery is evident quite closer to the development of symptoms, but may still have higher yield than nasopharyngeal swab, but slightly lower than bronchoalveolar lavage or sputum specimen. Antibodies are recovered after one week of illness, developing before the second week. There are dissenting opinions regarding the degree of protection rendered by these antibodies as, pre as at present as studies are continuously being conducted given the novelty of the SARS-CoV-2. Baseline tests aside from CBC, transaminases, ECG, and chest imaging include mostly inflammatory markers or acute phase reactants. Likewise, blood and sputum or ET aspirate cultures and sensitivity and PCR for other respiratory viruses should be included in the initial evaluation. 
studies have shown that even before the positivity of NPS or OPS become evident, the presence of ground glass opacity in the CT scan may give a clue to the existence of COVID-19. Though this is not exclusive to SARS-CoV-2 virus and may be seen in other causes of, of inflammation and infections. Management of mild to, clinic, to critical COVID emphasizes on isolation. For those who are symptomatic, Supportive care is, indi are, are, is indicated rather, and those who have been sent home should receive complete instructions regarding hospital consult when symptoms persist or worsen. Take note that in this stage of illness, antibiotic use as prophylaxis or treatment is not recommended. Decision for the location of isolation of moderately ill patients depends on clinical presentation, requirement for supportive care, potential risk factors for severe disease and conditions at home, including the presence of vulnerable persons in the household. Still, antibiotics are not recommended unless there is strong suspicion of bacterial infection. They should be monitored closely for any symptom progression and should receive clear instructions on the mechanisms to be followed in case inpatient management will be needed. In severe COVID, all areas where patients may be cared for should be equipped with pulse oximeters, functioning oxygen systems, and disposable single-use oxygen delivering inter interfaces, emergency signs of obstructed or absent breathing, severe respiratory distress, central cyanosis, shock, coma, and or convulsions need to be recognized, and such patients should receive emergency airway management and oxygen therapy during resuscitation to target oxygen saturation above or equal to 94%. Fluid resuscitation should be done cautiously to avoid further worsening of oxygenation in cases of fluid overload. In critical COVID with ARDS, initial non-invasive mechanisms of oxygenation may be administered, but if there is persistent hypoxemia and intubation need to be done, trained and experienced personnel should perform the procedure under airborne precautions. Disconnecting the patient from the mechanical ventilator, um, which, which results in loss of um, PEEP, um, atelectasis, and increased risk of infection, rather, uh, sorry, going back. In critical COVID, the lower tidal volume, um, lower tidal volumes and lower inspiratory pressures are utilized. And in those with severe ARDS with a PF ratio of less than 150, prone ventilation for 12 to 16 hours per day is recommended. Now this connecting the patients from the ventilator, which results in loss of uh, positive and expiratory pressure, atelectasis and increased risk of infection of healthcare workers should be avoided. There are conditional recommendations regarding the use of high positive and expiratory pressure ventilation and neuromuscular blockade, which in this slide I have marked with the uh, asterisk. Likewise, there is conditional recommendations on the airway clearance techniques and extracorporeal membrane oxygenation in those with refractory hypoxemia. Septic shock recognition is important so that vasopressors can be given to maintain mean arterial pressure equal to or above 65 millimeters mercury and lactate equal to or above 2 millimoles per liter in the absence of hypovolemia. In adults, 250 to 500 ml crystalloid fluids are given as rapid bolus in the first 15 to 30 minutes, a strategy quite different from the 30 ml per kilogram per hour used in non-COVID related sepsis. In those resistant to fluid loading or those with signs of volume overload, such as jugular venous distension, crackles on long auscultation, pulmonary edema on imaging or hepatomegaly, Reduction or discontinuation of fluids may be warranted. Hypotonic crystalloids, starches, or gelatins should not be used for resuscitation. Likewise, administer vasopressors when shock persists during or even after fluid resuscitation to maintain target MAP and improve the markers of perfusion. Take note that chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, antivirals, 
immunomodulators and convalescent plasma are only approved in the setting of clinical trials. There is likewise a recommendation against the routine use of systemic corticosteroids for treatment of viral pneumonia. Complications arising from COVID and how to address them will be discussed in the following slides. So we go first to thromboembolism. Use pharmacological prophylaxis, preferably low molecular weight heparin when, non, when not contraindicated. However, for those with contraindications, mechanical prophylaxis use is advised. Signs are symptoms suggestive of thromboembolism such as stroke, deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, or acute coronary syndrome should be monitored. It is important to check the adverse effects of medications and drug-to-drug -drug interruption. Bundles of care including awakening and breathing coordination, delirium assessment and management, and early mobility should be instituted to address complications arising from prolonged mechanical ventilation. Provisions to address possible ventilator-associated pneumonia should be implemented and include oral intubation over nasal intubation, head of bed elevation of 30 to 45 degrees, use of closed suctioning system, periodic drainage and removal of condensate in tubings, use a new ventilator circuit for each patient, and change the circuit only if it is soiled or damaged. A septic technique should be observed in catheter insertion and also provision for its removal when no longer needed to avoid the development of catheter-related bloodstream infection. To avoid pressure sores, turn the patient side to side every two hours. Early enteral nutrition and use of either H2 receptor blocker or proton pump inhibitor should be initiated in those with risk for stress alteration and GI bleeding. Those who have been on mechanical ventilators for more than 48 hours, those with coagulopathy or on renal replacement therapy, those with liver disease with multiple comorbidities and higher organ failure scores. To address antimicrobial resistance, early de-escalation should be observed and avoid the use of antibiotics in those with low risk for bacterial infection. To limit adverse reactions to antimicrobials, shortening of duration of empiric antibiotics may be done. COVID-19 carries with it the following, a case fatality rate of 2.3 to 7 percent, asymptomatic to mild illness develop in 80 to 81 percent, while 14 to 15 percent have severe illness and 5 percent develop critical illness. The big question is that can dengue and COVID coexist? From the WHO, depending on local epidemiology and clinical symptoms, tests for other potential etiologies such as malaria, dengue fever, typhoid fever as appropriate. Looking into the clinical experience in Thailand, a healthcare worker acquired COVID after taking care of a patient who was initially diagnosed with dengue, but later on was diagnosed to have concomitant COVID after respiratory symptoms developed later on in the course of illness. Due to the initial absence of the respiratory symptoms, appropriate transmission-based precautions were not applied, thus exposing the healthcare worker to the coronavirus. From this case, we have learned that respiratory infection control has to be considered for any patient with a possible infection, regardless of whether they have overt respiratory symptoms. Not all COVID patients have fever or respiratory symptoms at the time of presentation, and COVID may occur in conjunction with a common infectious disease, in this case, dengue, or may be misdiagnosed as another more common infection. In this next slides, we will present the Singapore experience involving COVID patients who presented with false positive dengue tests. The first case is a 57-year-old male who had three days fever, cough, and thrombocytopenia. He had normal chest x-ray and negative dengue NS1, IgM, and IgG. As his fever persisted and thrombocytopenia worsened along with lymphopenia, a dengue rapid diagnostic test for IgM and IgG was performed showing positive results. He was managed as such until due to the, per, to the worsening cough and dyspnea, repeat chest x-ray was done and SARS-CoV RT-PCR yielded positive results. 
retest of the original seropositive sample and the urine and blood samples were negative for dengue, chikungunya, and Zika by RT-PCR, and his dengue rapid tests were negative for IgM and IgG. A 57-year-old female presented with four-day fever, myalgia, mild cough, and two days diarrhea with thrombocytopenia and again positive dengue IgM. Two days later, she had persistent fever, worsening thrombocytopenia, lymphopenia, transaminitis, hyperbilirubinemia, and normal chest x-ray. She was admitted, but on the third hospital day, despite normal hemogram, she had dyspnea and persistent fever. She had positive SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR with negative repeat dengue repeat rapid tests, and even in the earlier blood samples, the dengue RT-PCR was negative. Based on that experience, we can say that failing to consider COVID-19 because of a positive dengue rapid test result has serious implications both in the management of COVID and also for public health protection. It is likewise important to recognize false positive dengue results in patients with COVID-19. For the big question, what is the prognosis of coexisting COVID and dengue? Your answer is as good as mine. I don't know. Since at present, there is still paucity of evidence. And there is a, and there are such are such most are limited to anecdotal or shared cases. As I close this lecture, we should remember a few important points. We need to rule out COVID in the face of other infections, even when we are simply considering dengue. The symptoms of these two illnesses may overlap or even present atypically. Likewise, spread of COVID needs to be controlled by the use of appropriate PPEs while attending to infectious patients or other suspected or even proven etiology until COVID-19 has been ruled out. Treatment for the two viral infections at present is at best supportive, but physicians should be mindful of the appropriate hydration to avoid complications and even mortality. While we are often preoccupied by messages or news from various platforms about the latest in SARS-CoV-2, we have to recognize that we can still plead guilty of ignorance regarding many aspects of the virus. As the days go by, we discover new things like this possibility of coexisting dengue and COVID, which will likely test our knowledge and skills in diagnosis and management. Thus, it is quite important for us to regularly communicate with our divine healer and greatest scientist so that we will be guided to enable us to learn more about the nature of our enemy so that vaccines and even antivirals may be discovered to halt COVID-19. By doing so, we will be restored to health physically, mentally, emotionally, and most importantly, spiritually. Good day, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Bergantin, for that uh, comprehensive lecture on dengue and COVID-19. But we, before we proceed to Dr. Bernsolido's lecture, let me uh, present to you a video by PCP. So that was a cool video from the DOH reminding us that uh, we should take care for during COVID-19 pandemic. Now, I'm going to call our second lecturer, Dr. Buen Salido, to give us light again uh, regarding COVID-19 and dengue. Yes, uh, 
Can you hear me? Yes, Doc. We can hear you. Uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be sharing the screen now. Okay. All right. Can you see the slide? Uh, Daisy. Yes, Doc. You, you can uh, right. start. Okay, you right. can see the slide. All right. So yeah, uh, I'm Dr. Buen Salido, John D for short. Uh, this is actually just a reaction or more 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 like additional input uh because uh, dr la bergantin already gave a very uh, nice comprehensive lecture so i'll just uh, give additional input on dengue and covid 19 together no? so i have no disclosures uh, let me start with that and uh, for epidemiology you know there are other countries and uh, dr bergantin mentioned this uh, there are other countries are also um, preparing and imagining what will what it will be like when uh, dengue starts coming in you know, on top of COVID-19. So this is just an example of a, a study, you know, and it's not really a study, but uh, this is a paper uh, showing that uh, doctors from Latin America, Ecuador, you know, are already thinking of how it will be, you know, high co-infection rates most likely mixing of symptoms which will make it difficult no, for physicians everywhere now um, and then because of the addition no, of, of, of dengue in addition to covid no this uh the numbers may exceed the availability of units and beds in the hospitals so just as an example here in this uh, country no, konti lang yung hospital nila, no? so really and sa atin naman, uh, well we have lots of hospitals but again the problems which we shall see later on and which has been described earlier uh, are really are real no? and uh, the possibility of false positives you know, by rapid dengue tests is uh, also there uh, it was mentioned that failure to consider covid-19 due to false positives may have serious implications meaning false positive dengue test no? it doesn't mean that uh, we have a dengue positive test and we rule out COVID, no? yeah, we still have to observe and um, these patients because of possibilities of false positive. So uh, I went to the DOH uh, website um, in preparation for this lecture, and I saw that the last Dengue monthly report was actually 2019, final August. So, but again, the WHO meron naman silang data as presented by Dr. Bergantin. No? Um, so I, what I did was went back to 2019. How, how was it in 2019? If you look at this slide, uh, the yellow no, are, are the cases, the dengue cases per week. So from January, it went down. And then starting June, which is where we are now, no, but this was last year. Starting June was uh, the start of the creep of cases going up and uh, up to a maximum in around August, something like that, no, or July. No. But as you see, we are in uh, the time no, wherein we are expecting dengue really will be coming in. No. And what I decided to do was I looked at uh, the, the data of uh, COVID. No. There's a, an online um, a source no, wherein, wherein you can get uh, the, the numbers of, uh, of COVID. No. And it's not a theory. Let me go. So this is the next slide. So this next slide uh, shows from uh, March to early June. Okay. So here you see that uh, from low, this is the these are the COVID uh, COVID numbers. No, that peak ng isa and then next start na naman in early or the first third of June. No? First first part of June, no? which is where we are. No? So we see in this slide. Uh, there's a potential for them to to really uh, to increase in terms of numbers. No? So our hospitals might really be uh, um, overwhelmed no? if we are not prepared. And just to take a look at the COVID numbers, the one above is from WHO. Of course, in March, palang, and then nagumakyat ng April. And then went down a little bit, but it's maintained. No, it's ranging these days from hundreds to three hundreds, so mainly two hundreds. 
But if you see, if you look at the the graph above, you know, it's it's still it's it's con consistent so far. No? The red line shows mortality, at least mortality from 12.5% in March has gone down to around 6 to 7%. And this was also mentioned by Dr. Bergenti earlier. And the one that we superimposed in the previous graph is the one below. No? And we see that uh, in, in June, tumataas na naman. We know that the lockdown has been relaxed uh, starting June 1. And I'm hoping that it won't cause a, an increase again. But, you know, we should be prepared and we should be ready. Now, with regard to uh, dengue and COVID, uh, it was mentioned that they have mainly similar features. No? So it's really hard to differentiate clinically. No? But we do need to make a diagnosis when they come, especially at the emergency room. No? And what I envision is we will see a lot of impressions such as probable dengue versus COVID-19. So that's really one of the things that uh, we, we shall see in the emergency room. And we, we as well will do, no? we'll diagnose. No? Of course, we will need to do the, the tests that were mentioned by Dr. Bergentin, NS1 antigen, uh, with or without the uh, antibodies, SARS-CoV-2, PCR, and an X-ray. X-ray is really essential these days. No? And this is how I see it. No? Um, the first is, if you look at the first line under number two, probable dengue without warning signs versus COVID-19. In the past, if we remove COVID-19, these are patients that we will not admit. We will send them home, close monitoring, et cetera, et cetera, right? But because we added versus COVID-19, so we won't be able to send everyone home. So those below 60 years old and no comorbids, probably we can send them home. But, then, you know. but the 60-year-old probable dengue without warning signs, but because of there's, there's a, a suspicion of COVID or those with, with comorbids, then we might need to admit them. So that's an additional uh, number of patients that last year we would not have, uh, we, we didn't have. No, these, For this year, we will have additional patients uh, that are without warning signs but with con with a consideration of COVID-19. Now, how about the probable dengue with warning signs? So we used to admit them all, right? Versus COVID, of course, in the diagnosis versus COVID-19 because at that time, hindi pa natin malaman kung which one is which. No? Do we admit all? That's one question. Or do we admit those with worsening warning signs? Do we increase our um, our uh, threshold to admit these probable dengue with warning signs versus COVID-19. Now, the, the, the thing that I was thinking about, what would be essential would be a fast SARS-CoV-2 PCR turnaround time. If our, our PCR turnaround time will go back to the early days, no? the early days uh, where, where in the turnaround time Came, came from two days, came five days, seven days, ten days, eleven days. Now that will really uh, pose a big problem. No? But these days, many hospitals are able to have a faster turnaround time. No? Okay, so that one is essential, or else mat matiteng that talaga yung mga patients no? while waiting for the COVID diagnosis. No? Okay, or or else mga mangyayari, we will we will treat as COVID, then admit admit talaga sila, right? So this is what I was saying. You know, the warning signs presented earlier was for last year and earlier, right? But to maybe reduce uh, admissions, no, maybe we should increase the uh, the criteria, make make the criteria stricter. This is one suggestion, no, for admission. Instead of having just abdominal pain, or this dengue suspect or this dengue patient has abdominal pain. Maybe we, kung mild, kung some beses lang, dalawang beses lang, nagkaroon ng sakit ng chan, for example, maybe we can still send home, but with um, very important and uh, comprehensive discussion with the patient on when to come back uh, to the hospital. Same with the persistent vomiting. Doon sa ating uh, uh, dengue classification as to levels of severity, so warning signs, it always had, had been said persistent vomiting even before, right? Now, but uh, 
I, I even me no in the past no pag medyo vomited times two or three times uh medyo mababa yung admission criteria but maybe for this season no maybe we should really uh make sure that it's persistent vomiting with the same advice to come back if worsening and then uh recurrent mucosal bleeding instead of just mucosal bleeding so many times, you know, nosebleed na nangyari once or twice or nagkaroon ng gum bleeding pero nag-resolve na, uh, we, might, we might decide not to admit these patients unless maging recurrent talaga or worsening at the end. And the others, the same, except maybe for restlessness. No? Maybe we can put restlessness, uh, put, put it down uh, for, uh, among the criteria that might not be the admission for now. But definitely an increasing amount of it and a rapid decrease in pit that count may would be a warning sign. Now, with regard to um, the initial approach in managing dengue and COVID-19, this was mentioned before by Dr. Uh, Bergantin. Basically, we know this. These are the, the ones that I'm showing are the baseline tests, or at least the bare minimum of tests uh, for dengue on the left and for COVID on the right. No? Now, if you look closely, the hydration part, which is the cornerstone for dengue management, uh, is on, is has an asterisk, and on the COVID side, it's also just cautious hydration, also mentioned by Dr. Bergantino. Now, again, medyo pag COVID versus dengue pa tayo, hindi pa natin sure. No? Uh, then we might need to you know, hydration natin for dengue suspects. We might need to uh, pull back just a little, no? No? but monitor the patients no? because. If this patient turns out to be a severe case of COVID no, and ARDS occurs, uh, it can the hydration may worsen the um, ARDS or otherwise known as non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, no, right? So and then monitoring, so basically the the same, but the hydration is the, is the only thing that's different no, in this particular slide. Now I just wanted to share our. Um, I'm connected with Makati Meditation Hospital. We have uh, the experience that we had. No? Uh, what makes because if you look at the, this these pictures, no, the picture on the left, no, shows an article um, praising Makati Med's successful COVID-19 treatment and Meditation hospitals on the on the right, no. And the reason I'm showing this is because uh, for some reason, a uh, a Caucasian doctor, no? Dr. Andrew Saul, was able to get uh, this pie chart, uh, which was actually intended for internal use only or in Makati Med, uh, for um, parang moral booster. No? But for some reason, this this uh, physician, uh, who is actually a, here says a specialist in natural healing, was able to get this uh, pie chart. And of course, it showed that recovery was 81%. But since he was a specialist in uh, natural healing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, he focused more. If you look at the, the the paragraph beneath the pie chart, you will see the usual regimen that we give for COVID suspects, COVID uh, patients. You know? But at the end, you know, there's zinc and vitamins here also given. So being a uh, uh, specialist of natural healing, don't should focus. You know? So, but again, but really, this this. Uh, this chart was actually for morale booster. But that doesn't mean to say that we don't do it. In fact, we do do it. No? In Makati Med, we do give zinc, we give vitamin C, and same with Asian Hospital. No? And I wanted to spend a, a couple of uh, slides on that. No? I am part of the University of the Philippines as, prof as clinical, associated, clinical associate professor and also of the PSMID or the Philippine Society for Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. And uh, the two institutions together did a rapid review, and they did say and concluded that there's no current evidence for zinc for COVID-19. However, they did mention one in vitro study that showed possible effect of zinc on coronavirus uh, through inhibition of its RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, but this was on the original SARS-CoV-2 no? uh, and not the SARS-CoV-2. No? However, the last uh, sentence says, indirect evidence was found in three meta-analyses done in the past five years on zinc and zinc supplements was found against the common cold. And why did they say this? And I wanted to present to just 
focus on that a little bit. So this is the, one of the, the newest, actually, the newest meta-analysis on zinc for viral URTIs. No? And let's see what, what, they, what they showed. No? So forest plot, meaning you have the line of uh, zero, line of unity in the middle, and you have the diamonds. No? If a diamond is far and does not hit the uh, line of unity, that means it's uh, significant. No? So if, if you look at zinc acetate and zinc gluconate, the two diamonds do not hit uh, the line of unity or zero. And that means if uh, the, you get the overall effect, no? the estimate is that uh, zinc for viral URTIs, which is also known as the common cold, no? viral URTIs is equal to the common cold, uh, shows that with zinc, there is around a 33% reduction in common cold or viral URTI duration. Okay? So this is what shows. Although on the slide, it shows that uh, the diamond of zinc acetate is much better than zinc gluconate. But nonetheless, zinc gluconate, uh, it's a significant uh, reduction. And the one on the left, no, and this one, shows that if you look at the horizontal bold line on that graph, no, I just uh, you might not see it, but it takes at least 75 milligrams of elemental and uh, focus on elemental zinc reduces viral URTI duration. Okay, not the low dose, and we shall connect this later on to coronavirus. But uh, for now, let's let's look at look at this. And it says that from this study, at least 75 milligrams of elemental zinc reduces viral URTI duration. This is the second meta-analysis that they mentioned, but this is older, a little bit older, no? 2012. No? And what did they show? All another uh, forest plot showing um, a shorter duration that's significant of the viral URTIs in adults with zinc. No? Yung nasa taas na diamond does not hit line of unity, but the one for children, unfortunately, uh, hits unit, uh, the line. So uh, it's not significant for children. Now, same meta-analysis, older one, high-dose zinc is much better in shortening viral URTI. So they, they uh, split the data between high-dose zinc and low-dose zinc. And if you look at the diamond above, that's for high-dose zinc, it's far and away from the line of unity versus the low-dose zinc doesn't, still doesn't hit uh, the line of unity but it's nearer. No? So high dose zinc is the one that is significantly more, uh, I mean, it's better between the two. Okay? And this is what we have in the Philippines, no? zinc preparations available in the Philippines. We have zinc gluconate, 70 milligram tablet, no? or the 70 milligrams per 5 ml. Um, and then we have the zinc sulfate, 55 milligrams per 5 ml. No? Uh, no, we give tablet, we give syrup to adults, no? so uh, we do that. But what I wanted to focus here on this slide would be on the right. No? Because we mentioned earlier that the 75 milligrams at least of elemental zinc is required. No? So we don't take the 70 milligrams of gluconate. We need to compute the elemental zinc. No? So zinc gluconate has 14% of elemental zinc and sulfate has 23% of elemental zinc and down the line. So I put there on the left side naman, uh, the, so, so for us to reach the target of 75 milligrams, no, we will need at least two tablets every six hours of gluconate and 10 ml every six hours of gluconate and then 10 ml three times a day for sulfate. Okay. So just to focus on that. And th these are cheap, no? The tablet, uh, one zinc gluconate tablet is four milligrams, four pesos around around that. So in this And we already showed the, the benefits uh, with high dose uh, zinc for viral URTIs. And we shall connect it, like I said, later on coronavirus. And uh, this is the old meta-analysis, no? Zinc acetate appeared better in the old meta analysis, but in the new one, gluconate was also significantly uh, good. Um, and in terms of severity of viral URTIs, no, there is also a trend to improving severity. Okay, but it hit the line of uh, unity and so, so Misha significant. No. Now, this one's very important slide, no? 
uh, it's a forest plot showing that uh, these viral URTR common cold patients, given zinc, had a bit more adverse effects, but non-serious. When you say non-serious, what did they find? Uh, bad taste, number one. Uh, nausea, some vomiting. Uh, so mainly GI side effects, you know, but not serious ones. But it's more non-serious adverse effects. So we take that into consideration. And this is the one that, that binds the, the uh, discussion. No? Why was I discussing viral URTIs and zinc? We know that rhinovirus is the number one cause of viral URTIs or the common cold. However, uh, based on you know, this is coming from Mandel, the you know, so called Bible of Infectious Diseases uh, specialists or fellows, no? coronavirus actually number two at 8.5%. Much lower than rhinovirus, you know, but still, still number two, a far number two. So that's one of the reasons why we considered it you know, for for uh, our COVID patients. COVID is actually an RTI, sometimes a URTI, but sometimes it becomes an, an LRTI when it becomes a pneumonia. You know? So with the benefit, it's cheap, you know. It's not like costing these around 20 plus thousand. No? This one is, is relatively cheap no? with, a, with a good uh, adverse effect profile. No? Non serious, albeit uh, higher than uh, without it. So, so we, we, that's, that's actually the, 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 mainly the rationale why we, we gave it. No? Now, how about zinc for dengue? evidence. So the first study above shows bench evidence. So this is lab evidence that zinc placed in uh, dengue two infected viral cells no? accelerated apoptosis of those cells. Kumbaga parang they suicide sila so that the dengue inside will also die. Right? But not just bench evidence. There's also clinical evidence uh, in pediatric unfortunately walang adults eh pediatric studies showed that a, the zinc levels were significantly lower between syndromes. Well, what does that mean? So dengue fever had higher zinc levels than those with dengue hemorrhagic fever. And then dengue shock syndrome had significantly less uh, or lesser zinc levels than dengue hemorrhagic fever you know, with a p-value of 0 0.001. Um, and then the, this is also from that, that study, they mentioned that zinc is crucial for normal development and function of cells, mediates non-specific immunity, and zinc deficiency adversely affects the development of acquired immunity in terms of T-cell activation, T-helper-1, cytokine production, and B-cell helpers. So also adversely affecting macrophage function in terms of intracellular killing, cytokine production, phagocytosis. So, uh, with zinc deficiency, it, it uh, impedes our immune system in terms of fighting viruses. No? Of course, zinc also has other basic cellular functions as shown. And third to the last study for zinc and dengue, no? this is another pediatric study, 39 pediatric patients with dengue. They looked at zinc levels of patients in the toxic phase and zinc levels at the recovery phase. Remember, Dr. Bergantin talked about the uh, febrile phase and the critical uh, phase, no? That's part of the toxic phase. So, mas mataas, pag mas mataas yung AST, zinc levels are much lower, slightly, no? kasi p is just 0 0.04. And however, dengue shock syndromes, syndrome patients had lower toxic phase zinc levels versus Patients who were not dengue shock syndrome. Okay. So, may nangyayari. And here, this, this uh, graph shows it better. No? Zinc levels in toxic phase, which is the uh, black uh, bars, were lower. And you see that they're lower than the gray ones, which are higher. And those are the zinc levels in the recovery phase. No? Second, if you look at the black one, it's trending downwards. Okay, so from dengue fever, medyo, so medyo the same with dengue hemorrhagic fever 1, but medyo mababa with dengue hemorrhagic fever 2, and even further down in the 
the Dengue shock syndrome patients no? in terms of zinc levels. So there's something there, no? Bumababa, uh, with, with worsening, parang buma, it's associated with decreased um, levels. There's also a randomized trial in 2018, a double-blind randomized trial of 50 children. You see, it's a little bit so of that's the limitation of these studies. Ponti lang, tapos children pa, not that, that the population that we treat. No? Uh, but zinc or placebo was already administered three times a day for five days until defervescence. And they looked at defervescence, uh, hospitalization length, and severity of uh, the infection. So basically, they didn't find any uh, benefits except for hospital stay length. No? And this is a randomized trial. But uh, the treatment arm, those who got zinc, had uh, lesser uh, numbers of hospital day being in the hospital than those in the placebo. But especially those in, in the children who had zinc deficiency. Now, I don't know how many adults have zinc deficiency. No? So that's, that's a limitation right now. And I also did one study with uh, the primary author, is Dr. Jerome Fahard, who uh, Makati Med. I am resident, and we looked at zinc supplementation in dengue patients. Whether there were um, associations with changes in platelet count, mortality, morbidity, and hospitalization as well. But this is retrospective. The other one was uh, um, prospective, a randomized trial. So, based similar to what we what the randomized control trial had, no, most were we didn't find any except for disease progression, and that was significant, but the p-value was 0 0.043. So there were significantly less occurrences of disease progression based on our uh, cohort. You know. However, we didn't, in this study, there was no uh, patient who, who died. No. no one died. So uh, no one fit the inclusion criteria among those who, we found some patients, some patients who died, but they didn't, uh, they were Included because we wanted to include the mortality, but didn't fit the inclusion criteria. And the other problem was different doses were being given, and it's naturally so because uh, this is not actually standard of care. You know? um, however, when we balance the benefits and uh, risks you know, and the cost, you know, so there's there's a little bit of uh, uh, benefit. The weight is more going to the benefit. So. That's it, no? Uh, this is really just an a, a additional point of view, additional input for the lecture of Dr. Bergantin, no? Uh, however, you know, uh, what do I foresee that will, go, that will go on? I think we will continue to give zinc, but the problem with giving high-dose zinc in someone with uh, suspected dengue is that you might uh, aggravate uh, abdominal pain, abdominal tenderness, GI uh, side effects, and uh, which is why, um, some of us who have, who have given zinc for dengue start with low dose. Actually, for dengue, we give lower the low dose, not the high dose. However, if we, I, I foresee that this is what I will do. No, once uh, the once dengue has been ruled out, then I can increase to the to the I call it the respiratory tract infection dose of zinc supplementation. So yeah, so that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, Dr. Bergatin and I would, would uh, be happy to answer these questions. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Wenzelido, for that um, wonderful lecture regarding COVID-19 and dengue. So we have several questions already being raised by our viewers in the Facebook Live and in the Zoom. So first question, okay, I think this is for Dr. Bergantin. Um, you have mentioned a while ago that there are overlapping manifestations of and COVID-19. So in my personal experience, doctor, I have seen also patients that initially it will be like dengue will present only with leukopenia and thrombocytopenia, but without respiratory symptoms. So the question raised was, do you recommend screening for COVID-19 for all patients presenting with dengue-like clinical manifestations? Doctora, you are, uh, we cannot hear you. Okay. Okay. I'm, I have already uh, unmuted. Uh, yes. Uh, it may be prudent for us to check on the different um, 
uh, to check on possibility of COVID, even if we are dealing with other infections or if we might be dealing with other infections. As I have mentioned earlier on in my recommendations or some of the points that I have tried to uh, infuse uh, when I have uh, done this this uh, study and then this review of uh, whatever the literature has, uh, it will be prudent for us until we rule out COVID uh, to look into it because there will be a difference in the implications as far as public health is concerned. Um, as mentioned earlier, also, uh, we will need to implement the use of the respiratory protections, which we normally do not do when we are dealing with other infections. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bergenstein. So um, now the next question uh, for Dr. Buenzalido, Dr. John D. Uh, this is with regards to the use of zinc for COVID-19 or for other any viral infections. What's the difference between zinc picolinate and chelated zinc, which is available in different health health stores? No. So which yeah. do you recommend and why? Yeah, the, of course I can only base. Uh, of course, these are not standard of care, or although there is evidence for viral URTIs. But like I said, the it's hard to use because they just say elemental zinc, and the ones in the studies are zinc gluconate, which we have, zinc sulfate in some older studies, but they were not presented, although we do have it. And there is evidence on zinc sulfate. But in all because there's there's a comprehensive list of uh, zinc studies no, on different different viruses, including HCV, uh, HPV, um, even HIV, uh, and then of course um, common cold. No? Uh, there is not one single study that I saw about chelated zinc, and even picolinate. I've not seen. May mga zinc oxide, zinc acetate, zinc gluconate, zinc so. So not be able to recommend that or at least uh, say with a straight face that there is evidence on it. And I would just stick to with what was in the studies. As it is, no, the evidence may, may benefit no, for viral URTIs. But for COVID, it's indirect evidence trying, uh, especially in a virus that is new and we don't have any, any that much data as compared to other diseases. So yeah, I'll stick with the gluconate sulfate, um, which is what fortunately we have. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have seen from different news and also in social media that there are several institutions, I think including PGH doctor. Uh, regarding the study of virgin coconut oil for management of COVID-19, uh, what can you say about that doc? Oh, I'm not part of it, no, but I know that uh, we do have uh, colleagues in PGH who are working on it. I have not tried it, so I'm not the I'm I'm not the one of the experts who can talk about it. What I can only say is that yeah, there are studies ongoing, and best for us to wait. And virgin coconut oil is another cheap, uh, relatively cheap, uh, I guess, supplement. No? And uh, these are things that we should be looking at. And I'm glad to know that some of our colleagues are looking at this, at this possible intervention. Okay, thank you very much, Doc. Um, there's actually a concern regarding the use of rapid tests. So I think Dr. Uh, Rona Bergantin or Dr. Buen Salito can answer the question. Uh, it has been one of the um, issues being raised by different uh, societies, no? Uh, there's a question here. Would you recommend the use of rapid tests in febrile patients presenting in primary clinics? Because as we all know, the RT-PCR is not available, readily available. Can you comment on that? Maybe um, Dr. Arona. Highlighted again by WHO, and I have also discussed this clearly, I think, earlier on, that when we talk of rapid diagnostic tests, we are looking for antibodies. And antibody development often occurs later, at least seven days to 14 days. We may have FDA-approved kit, but this uh, rapid diagnostic test kits are not validated yet. So um, in keeping with the recommendation of the WHO, wherein the rapid diagnostic test kits should be limited only to research laboratories, then still we will uh, recommend the use of the RT-PCR. 
Okay, Dr. John E. Yeah, I agree. Um, I see a lot of uh, use of uh, um, IgM, IgG uh, on day three, day two, and uh, expectedly it's negative. No? However, in patients wherein you have high suspicion of uh, PCR negative and Dr. Bergantin elegantly showed that the uh, nasopharyngeal swabs would be around 70%, 60 plus percent sensitive. No? And again, negative siya. You even sometimes we repeat that negative pa rin. But in your heart of hearts, your diagnosis mukhang coronavirus pa rin. And then, kunwari, mga five to seven days na siyang as hospital. And maybe you can use the the, the test, no? And if you get an IgM positive, that, that, that uh, strengthens your diagnosis. Tao lang naman tayo. So sometimes we need uh, additional push for us, right? additional evidence for our diagnosis. But uh, that's it. And then the IgG, uh, as you know, DOH has has uh, guidelines on that with regard to uh, make, uh, making a diagnosis of a presumptive recovery. So I think that one has, has more has, has more evidence. No? So uh, looking the, by the statement of Dr. Arana and Dr. Johnny Buenzoligo, it's telling us that it should be guided by the physician, right, Doc? When they use the RT-PCR, uh, the rapid test, because uh, question followed up, follow up question uh, regarding rapid test. What can you say to the patients if they insisted to be tested for rapid uh, for this rapid antibody test? So they have to correlate with the clinical manifestation, and they have to ask for the uh, interpretation of a doctor. Because even some of my friends, no, they will text me. Uh, they have been tested for art for the rapid test, and yet there's no doctor to interpret the rapid test. Okay, for Dr. Rona Bergantin, there's a question here regarding the antiviral drug. Uh, I think we are using the pinavir, right, ponovir, uh, as investigational drug for COVID-19, and as, as we all know. This is also a drug being used for HIV patients. Mm -hmm. So, um, in your view, Doc, what can we do to decrease the possibility of treating COVID-19 patients with coexisting HIV patients? So, um, how about uh, the use? This is regarding the use of lopinavir, ritonavir, right? Yes, Doctor. Okay. So, uh, to start with, the lopinavir and ritonavir is being used for COVID simply because uh, your COVID, also your SARS-CoV-2, also has your MO uh, protease, which is uh, what is also being inhibited by your uh, lopinavir, ritonavir. Uh, so, we may use it because uh, basically this is part of our management for HIV, although definitely you cannot use your lupinavir, ritonavir alone in HIV patients simply because you have to use additional drugs. We don't want to have resistance for HIV in this patient, but it may have benefit for, for your patient, so indirect benefit for those patients who have COVID. Uh, probably I need to also wait for the, for the take of Dr. John D. regarding this. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely we need to do, before we start lopinavir, ritonavir alone, we need to do the HIV, at least the rapid test, so that uh, we know that we are not giving monotherapy for someone who has HIV. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's I, have, I have used it. No? In the past, I've uh, I used more chloroquine than, uh, than lopinavir, no? But uh, yeah, and then yung nga, lumabas yung paper, that paper that was retracted, no? um, saying that uh, more of hydroxychloroquine has uh, high adverse effects, etc. No? So na it, the WHO gave a recommendation, nigil yung, ano, yung, uh, yung hydroxychloroquine arms, solidarity, and uh, but. And then again, yeah, they retract, no? but uh, but I don't know. The damage has been done, I guess. You know? um, what do you feel about that, Doctor uh, uh Things we have right now are so dynamic. So I think what is correct now may be incorrect tomorrow, but may be correct again. So I think we have to be flexible. But what we need to understand is that we should uh, the we have to follow the dictum first. Uh, you should do no harm. So, primum non nocere. 
So uh, everything yeah, what right. we it's have like, here right now is probably learning points, learning issues that we will need to apply uh, later on when we practice or when we get to see more patients with COVID and some other coexisting um, illnesses. Okay, so that's the importance of evidence-based medicine. So we usually base our recommendation on evidence. And with that, there's actually a question here from Dr. Dante Morales. Will a respiratory panel be useful on all patients clinically suspected of viral infection? So I think uh, he's talking about the uh, viral panel in different hospitals. Um, what, what's your take uh, on that, Dr. John? It's very, it's very expensive. No, uh, I have used it, no? And I've seen a lot of uh, positive, well, not a lot, no, but uh, I, I have had COVID patients, and these are confirmed patients. Uh, I did respiratory viral panel, and some had uh, H influenza, some had enterobacter, some, some had E. coli you know, for some reason, no? but not a lot. No? So, and, and the literature states that uh, up to, I'm not saying it's 21%, but up to 21%. Of uh, COVID patients may have, no? so it's not a hard and fast rule, but some data have said that up to 21% may have um, bacterial co infection. Uh, but I, I don't think we should do respiratory viral panel for all. It's very expensive. If uh, clinically you think, and it's, everything's consistent with a viral infection, COVID 19 specifically, then I think uh, we should actually withhold antibacterials no? unless there is suspicion i myself um i'm guilty that during the first wave uh, where, where when we didn't know too much yet i was a little bit more lax in giving antibacterials no? but these days parang we're trying to you know go back to our antimicrobial stewardship uh, foundations and try to limit our antibacterials when there's the evidence clearly says that there's there's no um, uh, bacterial infection let's say we're, we're doing procalcitonin although procal sabi na, in some uh, in some studies like high procal has been associated with higher mortality but the reason why we do procal is to um, try to exclude bacterial infection uh, if we don't uh, use the procal we order it and it's 0 0.05 and we still continue with our antibacterial. My my thinking there is that we lang natin pinagawa kasi hindi na natin, hindi naman natin uh, ginamit. And it's an additional expense, procal plus antibiotic. Diba? So that's my take on it. Si Dr. Has. Uh, uh, yeah, Dr. Uh, I, have a, I have to ask Dr. Rona because, you know, in their... In several, uh, this type of panel is not available in all hospitals, only in selected hospitals. So as a virologist, Dr. Arona, can you comment on that question? Okay. Ide ideally, if cost is not of a concern, then we should do respiratory virus panel. But then again, when we treat, we have to look into not only the clinical manifestations of the patient, but the capacity of the patient and prioritize the needs of the patient. We very well know that when we talk of viral infections, most of the things that we need to do are only supportive treatment. So in this situation, then we may withhold the request of your viral panel. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, in fact, Dr. No, some, of the, some of the viral panels, uh, one... I did a couple of viral panels for a couple of confirmed uh, COVID-19 COVID patients. And the viral panel has a coronavirus part yes. there. And it was negative. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's specific. Uh, the, 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 COVID, yeah. uh, the, the viral panel that you have will not detect definitely the COVID because yeah. it's not included in the, in the list of the, of the viruses and probably even the bacteria that they are looking into. Yeah, but you have to understand that at that time, that was the time when the turnaround time from RITM was eight days, seven days. So, you know, let's try the cor mga coronavirus uh, part dun sa viral panel. Hopefully, baka mag well, we didn't see anything. We didn't see some. Anything. We learn. We learn. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I, our, uh, because of uh, limit, limitation of time, I only have to go into answer two more questions. So, for uh, the next question, this is uh, for Dr. John D because he discussed. A while ago, the benefit of zinc in viral infection. 
So there's a question here. Can you please elaborate on the pathophysiology behind zinc combined with vitamin C or ascorbic acid? No, actually, there's uh, vitamin C doesn't ha has a weaker evidence. You know, I'm not. If you think that I'm a believer of vitamin of zinc, you no, know, I am not as a believer of vitamin C. Okay, because you know, based on the studies, you know, vitamin C has a parang the benefit for viral URTIs is for those who um, are exposed to extreme physical stress. No? Yung mga, yung mga skiers, no? winter sports, things like that. No? But uh, I can, I can, kung baga kung mga kaibigan ko, I can speak for zinc. <laughs> but, but not for vitamin C. But for, for zinc, the pathophysiology for, for ano, uh, viral infections is number one. Yung sa ICAM-1, it acts on it, it prevents the ICAM-1 from sticking to the, to the epithelia and dumudula siya palabas. And then second, yung the ones that I mentioned earlier, uh, healthy helper cells, uh, uh, T cells, B cells, macrophage, uh, not inhibition, but uh, there's a, there is a problem with their normal function because of the zinc uh, deficiency. So if you you add zinc, no? it it uh, helps them go along and do their normal functions, including yung mga basic cellular functions that I said earlier. So those are the pathophysiology. Okay, thank you very much. I think for the last question, this is from no other than our PCP president, Dr. Mario Panaligan. Um, the bo Both of you can answer. Uh, among critical COVID-19 patients with coexisting dengue, what is your opinion on giving low molecular weight heparin as prophylaxis for dengue? Because we all know that uh, in COVID-19, there is hypercoagulability state. However, in dengue, the problem is there is a risk for bleeding. So which is, uh, what do you recommend regarding the use of uh, low molecular weight heparin for patients with dengue and with COVID-19? Dr. Arona? That's a tough question. <laughs> But definitely, one of the recommendations that we have when we talk of dengue is the fact that if there will be risk for, let's say, bleeding in these patients, then we should not uh, give something that will add on to that possibility of, of bleeding. Um, basically, probably we ought to monitor uh, the bleeding parameters of these patients and then see if indeed um, there will be that prolongation of your uh, PT, APTT, or probably, of course, during when you have thrombocytopenia, I think we should uh, shy away from giving our prophylactic low molecular weight heparin. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I cannot, in my my heart of hearts, give uh, heparin in a patient with dengue uh, we, because the, you know, uh, as everyone knows, now we are really we're giving supportive treatment for dengue. Uh, and then we're actually monitoring for bleeding. So I cannot give, no, unless it's in the confines of a clinical trial. In fact, uh, uh, there are a couple of Dr. Alejandria and a couple of us have uh, IRB spending. Kaya lang na naputol dahil sa, <laughs> dahil sa COVID. Eh. We had IRB spending for the HALO trial, that's heparin for septic shock patients. No? Uh, even then, no, kahit may konti, I, I, pero na, hindi ko, natatakot ako magbigay ng heparin. That's an unfractionated heparin for patients who are in septic shock, although merong evidence, and, and we've examined this in the septic shock guidelines that we just came out with, uh, may evidence uh, for heparin, but kung tayo lang, ako lang, magbibigay ng heparin, without ex previous experience, hindi ko kaya. Okay. Last na pahabol na lang po, mga doctors. How about the use of corticosteroids? When do you use it for COVID-19 patients? Uh, yeah. I think, yeah, for dengue also. Yeah. Cortic May, marami akong kaibigan eh. Kasi nung simula, nung, nung March, uh, when this was all starting, wala akong kaibigan. But <laughs> no, when chloroquine came, naging kaibigan ko yan. Kaya lang may nanira sa kanya. <laughs> Something like that. But steroid is also one friend that I uh, that I developed no, no, uh, for COVID, but not for COVID infection, but for COVID with ARDS. No, if you look at the JAMA, I mean the the JAMA article on made by the Surviving Sepsis Campaign people, no, 
they do recommend it, no? uh, although weak recommendation, uh, for ARD, COVID with ARDS, ako, I give it for beginning ARDS, pag uh, And I've seen improvement, no? So, kaibigan ko din yan. But not for COVID na hindi pa, hindi pa, ano, without ARDS. Yeah, yeah so, so, how about there, Dr. Arona? Yes. So, if there is really an, a need or an indication for its use, such as in ARDS, then by all means, we, we can give that in patients with COVID. But definitely, when we talk about dengue or let's say just plain COVID without that, that um, ARDS, I don't think we should, we should give that because basically when we talk of steroids, we know that it's a two-edged sword. Eh? Um, we can have prolonged shedding. It can dampen the immune responses. So definitely, uh, we have to look into the risks and benefits involved. So if you have your ARDS, then we very well know that the benefit is established. Then magiging friend din natin si steroids like uh, what Dr. John D is doing. So you, sh you, and should, and you also, should use it, yes, doctor. And also, okay. and also septic shock pala, no? Um, in the like I said, the first wave, the early first wave, uh, sobrang daming namatay, no? So in, during that time, a lot of unknowns. May mga lumabas na mga papers saying anti-inflammatories cause negative outcomes for uh, for co for COVID, ganyan, etc. So even my usual practice of giving steroid for septic shock, hindi ko binigay. Eh. But uh, nung March, I saw so many patients die, and then eventually, you know. Pismid had a lot of uh, good guidance, no? tocilizumab, no? et cetera, and then the sep surviving sepsis campaign. Uh, and then with addition of certain agents at, uh, at a specific time, no? not, not de cajon, but pag when they're about to worsen, when you give tocilizumab or methylprednisolone, for example, uh, I, I've seen it, no? I've seen that's experience, but I've seen them improve compared to when uh, the early March. So, kaya bigo ako na sila. So, at the right time, at the right time, right. yes, not indiscriminately, not indiscriminately. Yes. So it should be given judiciously. So, yes. I think um, it's eleven thirty, and it's time for us to end this wonderful webinar le lecture about dengue 19 and um, covid uh, dengue 19 dengue and covid 19 so combination dengue and covid 19 and uh, we had so much fun and we learned so much from our two speakers we know that they are very busy as infectious diseases specialists we thank you again dr arona Bergantin and dr john de buen salido for this very informative lecture and those who watch our webinar session thank you very much and pcp also thank you dr mario panaligan thank you very much are most welcome. Thank you as well. Bye bye. Hindi na tayo naka ano? Hindi nakamute po kayo dok. There. Yan na. So pwede na tayo magleave. Daisy, nakamute ka. Thank you, Dr. John D. Thank you, Dr. Rona. See you. <laughs> John D., thank you very much. Thank you sa PCP. Thank you, thank you. Bye. Bye. Leave na ako.